Okay, so this is chapter 11. I have changed a lot of things around this time. Um, if you like this formation better, then we'll use this from here on out. If not, um, then we'll keep it as is. I just wanted to give you guys some options to see if you preferred this presentation to um, previous presentations. And I know that there were a lot of slides involved, so I've managed to knock out quite a few of them. Um, I'm going to see if I can do the same for our neurology lecture, maybe even our um, eyes, ears, and nose lecture, because I feel like that's 100 slides. Uh, but those are the last two we have before we do the comprehensive overview, which I should have to you no later than eh, tomorrow night, I think would be appropriate. Um, that would give you plenty of time. Um, I also have a couple of other lectures that I have to do for a couple of other classes um, to help them out in their ability to study. Uh, anytime that you want me to dub over um, a PowerPoint presentation that you have done for yourself or as a group or as a team, um, let me know and give me give it to me about a week ahead um, because I do that for a couple of other people who work in independent groups. And you can also, you know, access everything on the on the channel if you need to, uh, just for further information. But I think I've I've blasted you with enough for right now, so you should just be good to go with your lecture slides for your class. So, all right, let's get going. So rather than reading the slide here, I'm going to try to teach a concept that is going to get you farther as you continue on to your NCLEX, to your big three. So I don't want you to look at gas exchange as breathing in, breathing out. We all know that we do it involuntarily. And that's why looking at it in that perspective isn't going to do us any good. It's like trying to assess cognitive impairment in someone by asking them their name and date of birth. Remember, we talked about this a couple of sections ago, um, that even in your last moments of life, you can still recall something because that is far deep into the amygdala, right, of your brain, the central, the central part. So we're, we're not going to mess with that. I want you to look at this as a polarity. I want you to look at this as a magnet to a refrigerator. Um, the reason I say this is because you'll notice that oxygen, O2, and CO2 both have O2 in them. So if you cross out the O2s, which by the way are negatively charged, you'll see that all that's left is a positively charged ion. And the reason for that, and the reason that we have acidotic processes from COPD exacerbation is because of this net charge. Because when you take out everything else that is empty on both sides, then all that's left is positive or negative. So if it's positively charged, we get more acidic. If it's negative, we get more alkalytic. So that's why I want us to kind of picture things in the slides when we talk about things like COPD exacerbation as we move along. Um, I say this because we need to understand what's happening inside of the body from a chemical perspective. So if we can break it down to basic chemistry, then we know what the rest of the body is gonna do. If I have too much of a positive charge in my body, my body is going to react differently than if I had too much of a negative charge, right? Versus having a completely balanced formula. So I'm going to go a little bit slower this time around, at least when we start talking about the first couple of things. And I say this not to annoy you with inorganic chemistry and organic chemistry and um, things of that nature. You know, we're not going to go into moles or anything, so don't worry about that. But I say these things because Sometimes when you are taking your exam and you see a bunch of numbers, you know, your HCO3, your CO2, um, your pH, and you're doing Rome, it all runs together because of the hype around the test itself. Um, I've heard several students say, I'm panicking because this is the second exam and this is when it went bad for me. I don't know what that means, but I, I, I guess I can imagine. But what I mean by I don't know what that means is I don't know what that feels like inside of you. And I know that that amount of stress you're going to have for that feeling that you have inside of you regarding this test, because it is the second one and because that was the threshold, if you will, my concern is that you're going to be so hyped up on the fact that it's test number two that you're going to forget what's going on around you. 
And if we can remember this concept versus a set of numbers and a, a set of applicable rules that go along with it, it's going to be a matter of just seeing it in your head versus cracking the numbers and knowing if we're Rome or, you know, what that looks like. Or if we know what the four basic, what I call the four basic food groups um, of uh, acid-base balances look like, right? So what I mean by that is if you go back to your review, I talk about how we go into respiratory acidosis and how that's normally a COPD issue. So if you can at least remember the meat and the potatoes of what type of process goes with what type of disease, then you'll be fine for your questions. This is for you and for when you go along to become a nurse and you're successful and you want to understand why things are happening to your patient. This is when we get into this big stuff because I can get all the codes in the world to get through my NCLEX, but if I don't remember anything, I'm still going to hurt people. And I don't want that for you and I know you don't want that for yourselves. So let's go ahead and look at this in terms of a polarity right because remember the the world is not what it seems what you see in front of you is nothing more than the distortion of your own contextual reference of, of what your perspective and, and that context looks like to you right reality is energy frequency and vibrational patterns and part of that is polarity so we're going to get a little bit into the nerd stuff It'll make it easier for you to understand. Now, I know right now it's like I'm speaking Greek, and that's fine. The more you hear it, the more it'll make sense. And when it clicks, I'm going to be really excited for you because you're going to see how really simple this information is. And it's simple because we have the cheat code within us. We just have to see it in a different way. So give it an extra couple of seconds. If you hate it, turn it off. But trust me, once we get down to like slide 15, you're going to be like, oh, I see what's going on now. All right, cool. I'm down. And then going through your exam is going to be so much easier. It's going to be so much easier. And I know everyone's afraid. And it's okay. It's okay to be afraid. But it's not okay to be defeated. That's when you need to draw the line. So let's not be defeated, ladies, gentlemen, and non-binaries. Let's not do that. Not today. Not ever. Okay? Let's do this. Okay, so when we're talking about this, I want you to look at upper respiratory versus lower respiratory. Um, the carina, which is the bifurcation between the left and the right lung, is going to be your, what I call a hijack spot. So everything from that point up is going to be your upper respiratory affection. So let's see. Um, here we go. Uh, so laryngitis, tonsillitis, polypoid, all of those things would fall under um, a upper res respiratory tract issue. And your lower respiratory tract simply is just anything that is below the level of bifurcation, which again is the carina, which is right at the, the T spot or the Y spot um, where we start to get into the segmented bronchioles. Um, Within that, you have alveoli, which I talk about a lot. I always talk about clown holding a bunch of balloons, and those balloons will represent your alveoli. Um, and in between that also are what's called um, uh, like epithelial cells and goblet cells. And goblet cells, they always color them green, so I always think about the green goblin. And um, their purpose is to create a, a mucosal like lining or... Um, snot basically <laughs> and its whole purpose is to um, fight off or pre present a sliding surface where these uh, this dust the stand or all the things that we breathe in um, kind of falls away from it so that we don't get sick um, so that's number one as far as uh, understanding the pieces and parts that we're going to look at and again, it's so much easier because these questions are going to say something along the lines of a patient with a URI, upper respiratory infection. Okay, well, it's only going to be so many things, okay? And the reason that there are the way that they are is because it's upper versus lower, right? So if you have a lower respiratory issue, you know that its function is going to be different and its treatment is going to be different versus upper. It's that simple. 
So I think I have talked this slide until there's nothing left to talk about. So we'll move on. Now, as much as I didn't want to reiterate the same slide, there is one little piece in here that is pretty important. Your lobes on your left side, there's two and your lobes on your right side, there's three. Now that's going to make a big difference here in a little bit because when we start talking about uh, lungs that collapse, lungs that, you know, start getting bubbly from CHF, your hot spot that I always go for is your tiniest bit, right? So your tiniest section is going to be your right middle lobe. That's when you'll hear everything. And when I say everything, I mean everything if it's going to do anything. Consequently, it's also the first area that's going to collapse if it is going to have any atelectasis, uh, which is where the uh, alveoli itself, the little balloons, um, shrink down or when they have a full collapse, which is when we have to start worrying about tension pneumos and such. So make sure as a nurse, you check this right middle lobe before you check anything, because this is the first one that's gonna dump into CHF overload. And this is the first second you're gonna hear anything in the whole body system, which is super important because if we're dealing with a CHF patient who's running on fluids because we believe they're dehydrated or uh, we have an inexperienced resident, we need to know how to quickly assess and determine if that needs to be turned off immediately. And uh, you usually, as a regular nurse, will just hit your hot spots, so up, down, up, down, and then you'll do your cross pattern on your back, and then you'll move on. And again, sometimes it's not going to collect in any of those areas specifically until it's so bad that we've got eh, maybe an hour or so to turn it around before it becomes a, a huge issue. So please keep this in mind. So when we're talking about the lobe and the pieces and the parts, um, we have the trachea and the bronchi. Um, that is what they call anatomic dead space. It just kind of sits there. Um, there's no gas exchange whatsoever within that area. I want you to look at it kind of like a straw, um, like a, one of those big fat, big gulp straws versus a thinner one. Um, and then as we move to the bronchioles, this is smooth and it constricts and it dilates. So this would be like the bendy straw that you buy and you can squish it. That would be the best way to look at that. And then your alveoli is where the gas exchange actually happens. So I want you to picture blowing bubbles in chocolate milk. There's going to be no exchange of gas within that area of that tubing because it's got nowhere to go. But once we get to the area of the chocolate milk itself, we have, you know, floating ions that are kind of, you know, diffusing around the area. And the act of us pushing that around is filling those alveolar sacs with, with the air so that we can blow those balloons up really nice, assuming that we have a, a good resistance and assuming that we have a good push, right? Because you got to have one and you got to have the other. So, you know, what we do is we push out that CO2, we bring in the oxygen that we get from the air, the plants go, mmm, CO2, yum, 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 and then they push out oxygen, and it's this wonderful little cycle that is the reason that we're still on this planet to this day. So, again, I'm trying to paint a picture in your head, kind of like a Picasso if I can, because when we get into a stretch and we start freaking out about these things, I want you to be able to see the cartoon in your head. And if you see how the body moves from the inside in your brain, like I do, the other bits and bobs, they're not so scary after all. You guys can do this. Let's keep going. So surfactant is very, very important. Uh, lipoprotein secreted by alveoli when stretched, um, which is really important because it, it keeps that hold, it keeps that tension um, so that that alveoli is less likely to collapse. And a lot of people go, well, wait a minute, isn't it blown up? And I'm like, yeah, but it's on negative pressure. So when you breathe in, rather than thinking that your gas exchange goes one way, what happens is you breathe in, and as you're doing that, your lungs expand. And then you breathe out, and then we push out that carbon dioxide, right? So the surfactant is very important, and I know that you've heard of the surfactant in OB because whenever we have um, a baby that comes a little bit too early, what's the first thing that we start pushing in people? Surfactant. So uh, 
three, yeah, three of my kids have come four weeks early. One of them came four and a half, and they were fairly large kids because they're all nice and healthy. Um, but the one thing that they freaked out about in the very beginning, because they didn't realize, you know, I just naturally have huge babies, um, is that they need to go ahead and push that surfactant in because the lungs are kind of the last things um, that need extra development, which is why they start pushing it in and making sure baby needs what baby has what baby needs um, so that everything will be okay when baby comes out. So atelectasis will be the collapsing of the alveoli. Now, everyone always thinks atelectasis is collapsing of the entire lung. It's not, it's not, it's not. Not necessarily. Sometimes it can be, but it's those balloons that collapse. And when I say collapse, I don't mean shuts all the way down. I mean, picture me holding a thing of balloons. I'm, you know, the clown from Stephen King's It. And I go outside and I'm like, you're going to float too. And as I walk out, it's freezing cold. What happens to those balloons? They shrink, right? So that would be the act of atelectasis, not a full on uh, can't use it, can't reinflate it type of deal. If it were truly collapsed, you would have to have a, a positive pressure to go with that negative hydrostatic pressure that is going on with your surfactant, with your goblet cells within the cells of your body within the alveolar sac. S super nerd stuff that you don't need to worry about. That's pathophysiology way beyond the point of what you should be interested in in, in today's day. So just know that atelectasis is in a true collapse because uh, as a nurse, when you read atelectasis, you freak out if you're brand new and then you call the doc and the doc's like, yeah, so? And I don't want you guys to sound like you're a newbie, right? Because these docs are going to size you up in about 10 seconds. And I love how when I do my sim with my, my groups, um, you guys get straight to the point when you are ready to talk about your patient. You don't spend five minutes telling me who you are, right? Which is very important because you have an identity in this world. But to a doc, you have to speak their language. And their language is, I know technical data. I don't know people. I do people, but usually from two to five minutes at best, and then I'm calling my nurse to make a call to bring me out of the room. Um, and, and that's where the empathy comes. It comes from us. They have the apathy. We have the empathy. So I need for you to know that if you sound apathetic towards them, and apathy is I could care less, I'm super uninterested, versus empathy, which is I, I genuinely know how you feel because I'm experiencing that feeling with you, um, if we if we reflect toward them uh, an act of apathy, like, hey, doc, real quick, patient 208, um, looks like they have a little bit of atelectasis. Anything you want me to do about it? If you keep it cash, they're going to be super cool with you. And that's going to be very, very important to create that bond early on. There's a lot of psychosomatics behind medicine. And if you need your doc to trust you to give you something that you need in a pinch, like fast, they've got to be able to trust you. And if they don't trust you, they're going to play that I'll be up there soon game. And the I'll be up there soon game can mean anywhere from, I don't know, five seconds to five hours. It's like Time Warner Cable. I'll be here between the hours of 11 and 8.30 at night. So keep these things in mind and know how important these pieces and parts are. And in some cases, how arbitrary they are. And that would be atelectasis because everyone's got atelectasis. I got some atelectasis right now. You got it too. We're in the cold season still, so that's a thing. Just keep it in mind. So, blue blood. First off, it's not a thing. This is the slide that creates the problem with the blue blood. So, a little, little quick story. My kid, uh, who's 20 now, got suspended for five days because she walked out of a classroom because the science teacher told her that blood was blue, and then when oxygen hit it, um, it would then become red. So at the time I was in nursing school and um, she asked me why blood was blue and I explained to her that it wasn't, that's not what it was. It was the, the pathway and it's trying to explain to you when it becomes, you know, uh, from a, a purely deoxygenated spectrum to an oxygenated perspective. And she goes, oh, okay, cool. And she got so offended that she walked out of the room and the teacher said, why are you walking out, Angel? And Angel turned around, who, by the way, was born 9-11. 
turned around and said, um, I'm walking out because anything you say from here on out is pure bollocks. And we had just moved from England, by the way. She's like, it's pure bollocks and nothing that you say I'm ever going to trust again because you're not educated enough to realize the basics. And I'm in third grade and I know better. And then she just took off. So I'm in a panel of, of 10 people who are educators and administration, yada, yada, yada. And they are looking at me. And at one point I look so disinter disinterested that um, one of them slams their hands down on the table and goes, what are you going to do about this? And I'm like, do about what? And they're like, how are you going to punish her? I said, punish? She was right. I'm going to take her to Kings Island for five days. And then I did. But not only did I do that, I sent them photos for every day. And they tried to get me on a truancy charge that didn't work. So long story short, blood is not blue. Don't get it twisted. Please tell your children so that they don't get it twisted either. And make sure that they don't act ugly to their teachers because that was improper but absolutely accurate. And I was cool with it because it was right. But anyways, moving on. I say these things because now in your head, you have the blue and the red blood in your head and you're picturing it, which is great because these are the cartoons I want you to, to color in your head. So gas exchange, the artery, deoxygenated blood from the right ventricle, right? Passes through, capillaries give gas exchange to the alveoli, pops back, veins, they return the oxygenated blood to the left atrium. And then within the bronchial circulation, the arteries take the oxygenated blood to the bronchi and to the lung tissues. And then the azygos veins take the deoxygenated blood to the superior vena cava. All right. Dun, 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 dun. Bah, now we breathe. So that's kind of how that works. And if you get stuck on it, know that you don't need to know all the pieces and parts that go along with life. Right. I'm trying to educate you past what I know that you're capable of learning because you're smarter than you think. So I want you to think about how this works. And again, play the cartoons in your head, follow the recipe because I'm, I'm, I'm training your brain to think a certain type of way. And this is the way that we need to th think in critical care nursing when someone's about to crash on us. And I know you guys can do it because you're incredibly intelligent, despite what you guys think. All right, next slide. So when we're talking about the structures and functions of the respiratory system, you got to remember Lungs are constantly moving, right? Breathing is an involuntary reaction. So that being said, you wouldn't want those alveolar sacs to keep hitting nothingness, if you will. So it's got to be coated with something to make that slide and make that smooth. And if it isn't coated, then you run into some pretty heavy duty problems. OK, and we'll get into that in just a little bit. So the chest wall has your ribs and your sternum. Um, your thoracic cage protects the lungs and the heart. A, your uh, mediastinum, or I've heard it called medastinum, not a thing, it's mediastinum, um, but cool, tomato, tomato, whatever, I give you kudos for getting close enough, right? Heart, aorta, esophagus, huge, huge, and huger, right? So that is the reason that it is double, double uh, thickness in that, in that uh, middle part of the sternum if you notice that is much deeper much denser than your ribs which are um, bony and reflect a curvature bony of course they're bony duh thin bone is what i mean they have a curvature at the end so it's easily to it's easy to break it's easy to puncture yada 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 but that that thoracic cage and specifically that uh, mediastinum is, is incredibly tough so that we don't get into these areas that are so incredibly important, important to us. The pleura, uh, we got the parietal chest cavity area. We've got the visceral area, which includes the lungs. And then we have what's called the intrapleural space. Um, that's basically two syringes full or two and a half of lubricated fluid um, and goblet cells that facilitates expansion and the negative pressure that uh, pushes them open and snaps them shut really quick so that we could get those really nice breaths. And without that, uh, it would basically be sandpaper on the inside. And there is a clinical diagnosis for this. And it is a major, major issue. And you want to talk about pain? Oh, buddy pain. We'll get into that. Uh, I think it's maybe 10 or 12 slides from now. So keep these things in mind when you're thinking about your cartoon in your head. So in your intestines, you have these little, these little fibers called microvilli and villi. I'm sure you guys remember those. They're like little fingers. And what they do is they push the poop along the way. What does this have to do with lungs, Molly? Okay, here we go. I'm getting there. 
So within your chest wall, you have your diaphragm, right? Sits below, has, uh, it's the major muscle group of respiration. So I want you to look at that as those little fingers that are moving the poop along. Only we're doing this up and we're pushing everything up. So the diaphragm is incredibly important when it comes to making sure that you can get a proper um, inspiratory volume. It contracts towards the abdomen um, and then it increases the intrathoracic volume, which then pushes things out farther. Um, it works with the intercostal and the scalene muscles. I don't need for you to remember all of those. Intercostals in between the spaces, obviously. Scalene is a little bit different type of striation. Don't worry about it. Um, they innervate the right and the left phrenic nerves um, that arises from the cervical vertebrae. It's three to five. Yeah, three to five is right there. So uh, why is this all important? Well, it's important because if you recall in your OB classes, when you're pregnant, it's really difficult to breathe, right? So it's the same absolute concept when we hear about people who die because uh, they're working a dumpster and um, they get a collapse. And although that their lungs are exposed, their diaphragm is collapsed or crushed, and then they end up dying from a crush injury. Um, this happened uh, three years ago to a friend of mine who was digging a hole with a, with a bobcat um, out on a farm, dug his hole, got at the bottom, and he went to go dump dirt. His dad jumped back into the hole, and when he did, he got a bunch of earth that covered him uh, right to mid chest and he couldn't move his arms. He couldn't move anything because of, of the pressure and the packing that went along with that dirt and the poundage, right? Just the sheer poundage and the ratio with which he was already covered. And he died right there. Like he lasted a minute and a half. That poor boy was trying to dig him out with his bare hands like a dog. Um, so we're going to see crush injuries that will affect the diaphragm. And if that diaphragm is affected, we're going to run into some big, big problems. So keep that in mind. It's not just the lungs. The diaphragm is the bigger piece of the puzzle, right? It's the reason that we can speak louder like I'm doing right now, or we can be really, really light when we speak. So we, we use that just as much as we use the air that we breathe. Um, so just know that that piece of the puzzle is also an intricate factor in this body system. So partial pressure. Partial pressure is very important to know. I need for you to know what this partial pressure looks like and I need for you to know what it means, okay? So partial pressure is the oxygen that is dissolved in the plasma and it's arterial blood, okay? Just know 80 to 100 is what that looks like. It's PaO2 versus SaO2, okay? Remember the difference, write it down, commit it to memory. So oxygen bound to hemoglobin that is the arterial oxygen saturation or the SAO2. And that's going to be normal is greater than 95. Now, obviously, that O2 set is going to change as we get conditions like um, chronic COPD, um, chronic asthma and exacerbation. Those guys usually run at lower levels of oxygen. And that's to be expected. Uh, altitude plays a big role in this, too, because think about it. If you are at a higher altitude, you have a uh, higher count of red blood cells. Therefore, you have higher oxygen binding capacities. Therefore, you have a higher hemoglobin and you have a much higher um, SAO2 on a normal basis. Right. So you hear about blood doping and, and Lance Armstrong, if you guys even know who that is anymore. God, I'm so old. Um, and this is what we talk about when we talk about these things is that oxygen concentration within those red blood cells are so incredibly high in higher altitudes because think about it. How hard is it to breathe in a higher altitude? You ever been there? You ever been on top of a mountain? It, it's super difficult, man. It feels like you got something pressing on your chest a little bit. It's pretty challenging. Um, so know the difference between PaO2 and what those normal levels look like and what the SaO2 and what those normal levels look like because when we're talking about partial pressure of oxygen in arterial blood, um, that number could be completely askew and your SaO2 won't be off that much and it will absolutely mean that we're still putting our patient in a deadly process potentially.
So diffusion of oxygen and carbon dioxide exchange at the alveolar capillary membrane, they move from a high to low concentration until they're equal, just like a high to low gradient, just like simple diffusion. And all that means is when I drop in those components, they're basically going to sit around until my active movement is going to shuffle it around until it's completely balanced. And do you need to know that in the world? No, it just helps you create that cartoon in your head we're talking about. So when we talk about passive and active respiration, passive, um, passive is it makes it easy, right? Active means I have to put an action potential, right? So I have to... I have to put in the effort and put in the work to get a nice inspiration, right? I need to have that nice uh, elastic recoil. And then when we go into expiration, how easy is it to breathe out, right? We do it all the time when we get frustrated with someone and we're like, <sighs> it feels good to breathe out, right? Because it's a passive act. It doesn't require any extra energy. So this is where we have the problem with uh, people who have the COPD because this act of passive expiration is supposed to be so relaxed and unforced that we should easily carry that CO2 out. But because we have, when we're, when we're labored in our breathing, we're trying so hard because we can't feel that oxygen. We're breathing in so hard that we kick up so much of that excess a uh, positive charge that it stays behind. We can't kick it out of us and, you know, get rid of that CO2 exchange. We have that net positive charge in our body, and then that's when things turn acidic. So try to look at it in that type of light if you can. Like I said, it's a lot. It's a lot of pathophysiology. I know you guys are forgetful when it comes to that stuff because it was a billion years ago for you, and a day in the life of a nursing student is like a week and a half for a regular person. So I'm not even tripping if you don't get it. I'm just trying to make it easier for you to understand as we go along and start talking about disease process. And here again, we're talking about uh, the physiology of respirations and, and the act of compliance, which is how well your lungs work. How much do your lungs listen to you? It's like a non-compliant patient that doesn't take his meds. You would have decreased hard to inflate type of lungs because your lungs are non-compliant, right? And this is what we were talking about easier is we're, we're pulling so much out because we're trying so hard to inflate those lungs and get that air in that we feel we need because we can we can feel that we're having shortness of breath obviously and then we're unable to kick it out so it's hard for them to recoil to push it out and that's how we end up with all of this positive ion trapped in our chest so again increase heart for the lungs to recoil decrease heart for the lungs to inflate resistance um, the airflow is impeded during inspiration and or expiration um, and it's altered airway diameter. Uh, so it's narrowed by constrictions or secretions. So big words, what does it mean? All right, what it means is if I dump stuff in it, it's going to be harder to get the gas exchange, right? AKA if I have pneumonia, which is sludge in my chest, it's gonna be harder to take a breath. Pretty simple stuff. So we'll move on because I think you guys got this piece. So included into the structures and functions of the respiratory system is the control of respiration. I told you three sides ago about the phrenic nerve. We're going to get into that in just a second. And then it's all going to kind of make sense of how things work. So the medulla is your respiratory center. Um, it's in the brain stem. It responds to chemical and mechanical signals. It sends impulses from the spinal cord and phrenic nerve to respiratory muscles. Okay, why is that important and what does that matter in the world? First off, did anybody notice that there's an alligator over here and a toothbrush? Does anyone know what that's about? Has anyone seen the water boy? Because there's got to be one of you guys that get this joke, right? So in water boy, the alligator, he's ornery because he has all them teeth and no toothbrush. Because that's what mama, mama, mama said, right? So I threw that in there for you just so you can laugh. Because what I'm talking about is daunting and boring. But it's about to click in just a second. Just get me there. Just hang on, hang on, hang on with your fingernails. So the medulla, important. The phrenic nerve, even more important. So the phrenic nerve, two slides ago, three slides ago, I talked about how the C3 through the C5 are the main proponents of housing the beginnings of the phrenic nerve. Mainly it's four, but a little bit on five, a hair bit on three, I guess you can give it to them. So what happens is these phrenic nerves send the impulses to the diaphragm um, and they are directly attached to the diaphragm that sends the sensory nodes that say, hey, 
push. So when my friend's dad died, it happened not because his lungs weren't exposed because they were, he was able to expand and contract the lungs. It was because the diaphragm and that phrenic nerve had been crushed from injury. And once that phrenic nerve is done, you have an inability or dysfunction of that diaphragm and it can't expand and contract like you need to. So it is pointless to have the lungs. That is why it is so important to understand if you have a patient with a crush injury, you need to immediately assess if that diaphragm is having any type of issues whatsoever. And you can clearly figure that out just by watching it. So if there is a dysfunction on it, you will have an inoperable or immovable or imboundable uh, breath of your chest. So it'll look like you're breathing, trying to breathe from your belly, but the only thing that's going to expand is your flail chest, right? And we'll talk about flail chest in a little bit. Super important that we watch out for those guys. That's a medical emergency. There's not a whole heck of a lot we can do about it, to be fair. There are some things we can do, like mechanical ventilation, until they figure out how to hardwire it back. And it can be done, but it, it's a lot. And, you know, when we're talking about breathing, we only got a eh, couple of minutes at best. So you really got to watch out for those guys. And you can't move them around too much because if they do have a crush injury, without knowing what that looks like from the inside, we could easily maneuver things around and make it worse. So if you get a crush injury, especially anything that's C4, right? C4 is a big, a big problem because um, that's the main area. Or if you have someone, anytime you hear phrenic nerve uh, dysfunction, um, you're going to know that they're going to have airway exchange issues, period. So this slide is super wordy and confusing, and I'm never going to try to mess with you about what all this means. But the bottom line is, is uh, you are going to have an acidic process with the more hydrogen ions that you have that are dumped because they're positively charged, and you're going to have less of them in an alkalotic process. And all that means is things that are acidotic are positively charged, things that are alkalotic are negative charged. Look at alkalotic. The letter L looks like a negative charge if you flip it on its axis. That might have just confused you more. I'm hoping it didn't. Um, whatever hack you need to understand that alkalosis is going to be a net negative charge and acidosis is going to be a net positive charge. And we're going to get into why that's important here in just a bit. Because if we have a bunch of positive hydrogen ions, we know that we're in acidosis. It's not even a question we don't even have to think about it. We don't have to calculate nothing. We don't have to roam nothing. We just keep on moving. So try to keep these concepts in your head. If it's acidic, it's a positive charge. If it is alkalytic, it is a negative charge. So in an ideal world, we have these things called chemoreceptors, which send signals to the body to do things, basically. So you have your carotid bodies and your aortic bodies, and these are signals that are sent. So they're supposed to respond to decrease PaO2, which remember that's the arterial process, and decrease the pH whenever we're in a, uh, when we are at a alkalytic process or the pH is too high. And then it increases the PaO2 or PaCO2, which then produces a positive charge, which then takes that shift from the right towards the middle again, right? So this is how we compensate for these things. And then it also stimulates respiratory centers to increase the respiration rate if we need to kick it off, right? If we're trying to kick off all that positive charge, trying to kick off all that CO2, the chemoreceptor, again, will uh, send a signal to stimulate that respiratory center. Now, in COPD, this is the problem because you have increased PaCO2 because you are starving, you are oxygen starved, but it does not stimulate the respiration rate, which is what gives you the hypoxic drive, which is what retains all of that positive charge, which is what gives you that acidic blood and which puts you in that acidotic process. So there are also mechanical receptors in the body that are send signals to your body to respond to stimuli, such as like irritants, right? So when we get an irritant that goes into our lungs, what do we do? We cough. That diaphragm is signaled immediately and triggered. The zeveolar capillaries are triggered. The chest wall is triggered, and we physically cough. Now, the hearing brewer reflex, 
So this is a complex reflex that the body does inadvertently to stop the lungs from overinflating. Now the tidal volume or the volume with which you keep a level or a, a, an amount of oxygen in is usually about 500. So 500 mLs is about the capacity of the average lung. Now if you have like a master trumpet player, like from a jazz, from back in the jazzy days, um, those guys, they can have some pretty hyperinflated lungs. Sometimes they can do the upwards of a thousand, sometimes 1500. Now here's where we run into these problems. Have you ever heard of really, really tall athletes that get collapsed lungs really fast? Here's how. They're so used to these huge tidal volumes because they're running up and down a court. They're seven foot two, right? And what happens is, is the longer you stretch tissue, the more pliable it becomes, the more terrible it becomes, the more preferable it becomes, if that's even a word. I'm pretty sure that's accurate. Um, so we don't want those things to happen, which is why we will kick into what's called a herring brewer reflex that basically stops it from being able to continue to breathe in, um, which is why if you breathe in too much, you cough, which is why we give them an incentive spirometer and we tell them, hey, go at it. And they can only get to about 1200 before they start doing what? coughing so that's that reflex and fyi know it um but don't don't if you don't remember it don't freak out about it it's okay this is really really hard stuff the the level of training i'm giving you for all of these slides um and what i have been giving you is quite honestly a doctoral level um operating instruction and i do that because you guys are really that smart you just don't know it yet and um, it's, it's really bad to have that uh, imposter syndrome. But, you, you know, I say that, and at the same time, I still have imposter syndrome because I think I do a, a terrible job for all of you. Um, but our grades reflect otherwise, so I, I, got, I got to be doing something good at least, right? So J receptors, um, those are also capillary receptors that cause you to have, again, that cough reflex that stops your body from um, being affected in a negative way. And I don't need to get into the pathophysiology of it. Just know that there's mechanisms in your body that will make you cough if you are exposed to something that's either too good or too bad. Done. So goblet cells are super important. Um, they protect your lungs from a whole bunch of stuff, right? Um, it protects your lungs from filtration of the air. It helps you filter your lungs. Um, it gives you mucociliary clearance. So when you're trying to kick up and cough up things, your goblet cells create a barrier so that it stays at the surface of the tissue rather than absorbing into the, the creases and the parts of the cilia um, so that you can kick it out of your body like you're supposed to. Uh, I always think about green goblin when I think of goblet because they're even kind of shaped the same way. They got the same, they got the exact same color you see in a textbook. Um, so if you ever forget what the thing's called, it's called the green goblet cell. That way you don't mess it up anymore. I use a lot of Marvel references. I'm so sorry. I, I throw in DC too. I just, I'm a comic book nerd and have been since like 1991. It's disgusting. So let's see. We have, oh, as a system, it's an escalator. So it actually helps you um, as you're coughing push things out so if you notice your mucus is sometimes a little bit green a little bit slimy a little bit green and slimy it's got like two different layers to it it's because some of that is your goblet as well so newsflash guys as we get older things start breaking down <gasps> oh my god that's revolutionary so structural changes you're going to have reduced chest expansion and functional alveoli because your diaphragm is going to get bored it's going to get bored and worn out and tired and old and these things happen um, your alveoli those little uh those little balloons that uh the it clown is holding um, those also start uh, deciding to deflate a little bit. I, reading the literature in the Harvard Library, it looks like these things we're starting to find out that we start having atelectasis issues as early as 22 years old. So it's not just me. Ha! It's you guys too. Ha ha! Gotcha. You have reduced immune function as well, which makes sense. You have more gradual responses to changes in oxygen and carbon dioxide levels. So what that means is, is you... Uh, ironically enough, will start changing slower as you start to have more of uh, those positively charged ions, which would normally throw someone into acidosis very quickly. So a younger person 
you guys get thrown into acidosis like that. Like I know when something's wrong with you and about 20 minutes after you've had too much of something or not enough of something else. So if I give you, here's a prime example that you absolutely need to understand this concept a million times over, stop what you're doing, get your pen and paper ready and write this down. Here we go. If I am giving someone a narcotic, I am putting them at a decreased respiration rate because we're shutting off the sympathetic nervous system, right? So we're in pain. I've got pancreatitis. That hurts really bad. I can't lay off the alcohol because I'm a partier and I'm 24 years old. There, there's your scenario. 85% of the people who have pancreatitis is alcohol induced. Okay, so moving along. So I get you on a PCA pump and I'm giving you Dilaudid and you have your little button that you're hitting. We call it a go button. Hit your go button. Hit your go button. So you're hitting it and you're loving it and life is peachy and you're like, I can handle one more because you're still drunk and I'm trying to detox you. I can do one more. I can't eat or drink nothing because I got pancreatitis. My life is miserable. And you hit that button one more time and then your respirators go down to eight. Now, here's where it gets hairy. If I kick your respiration down to eight and you're on a PCA pump, that job of that opioid is to inhibit your respiratory function. And if you have inhibited respiratory function after all these slides I've been talking about it, what happens? You have too much what? Carbon dioxide in your chest. And can you kick it off? No, because I have shut down. Remember a couple of slides ago, I was talking about those nerves that were pretty important. I have shut down those nerves and I have shut down that process that sends those signals to your diaphragm that says, kick it out, kick it out. So I am causing you to be in a respiratory acidotic process if I don't watch myself and I don't take care of what I'm supposed to be doing with you. So it is my job to watch the respiration rate so that we know if things go awry and you're not making any sense to me, then I need to go get an ABG on you uh, almost immediately. Bottom line, no bones about it. And I say this not out of being funny, haha. I say this because... It happens. And when it happens to a 20 year old, there's just something that just dies inside of you because you know that you could have fixed that problem. And as a new nurse, I promise you, you're going to mess up and you're going to mess up often. These are the important pieces and bits and bones I need for you to not mess up on. Please, 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 because this will absolutely put a person in a bad state. And sometimes I can't recover those guys. Um, sometimes they don't make it. So if you know that you're giving somebody a medication that is going to give them respiratory depression, you have got, I repeat, you have got, one more time, you have got to keep them on continuous pulse ox at all times. You have got to make sure that you are monitoring that respiration rate like a crazy madman because if they hit that PCA pump too much, we need to go ahead and back it out. We need to go ahead and get that level. We need to lock them out at a shorter rate, a lower rate. We need to lock it out at a higher interval, which means instead of being able to hit that button every two minutes, I got to wait every five minutes to hit that button. We got to do whatever we can because when you're confused and you're drunk and you've got pancreatitis and it kills you because your amylase and lipase are through the roof and it's an incredibly painful process, I don't need for you to be hitting that button so often that I will put you in an acidotic state too quick. And with these guys, like I said, because their process is used to working like, like it's supposed to, just like right on keel like it's supposed to, because you're not older, you will start changing on me in no time flat. I'll go in there and then I'll go check on you in an hour to do your hourly rounding and you are a whole entirely different person. So if you see a change in this person, I don't care what's going on. The first thing you need to do is go ahead and call your doctor and ask for an ABG because you have probably respiratory depressed them too much. The second thing that needs to come out of your mouth is, can we please, please, please kick this woman or this man's PCA pump down because we're in trouble? You need to get a CO2 measurement. We need to know what that looks like. And you're going to get a CO2 measurement again from an ABG. So make sure. When you're dealing with people, again, and I've said it 15 times for a good reason, make sure that you're doing that CO2 measurement by way of an ABG, okay? And CO2 is all we care about because CO2 is going to let me know if you're in an acidotic process. And if that number is any higher than 35, buddy, we, we are there. We have arrived, but it's not a great thing. So, again, if anything like that happens, someone's respiratory depressed, they're on a narcotic that's continuous like a PCA pump. 
CO2 measurement by way of ABG. Got to get it done. Write it down. Thank you. So when we're talking about getting a proper health history, this is where it becomes imperative. Um, this is going to dictate how we're going to treat your patient, right? So here's my scenario. I am an 18-year-old, and I have a history of asthma. Okay. I know I'm not going to be doing anything to bring anybody in that room if they've been wearing perfume, period, because I am not trying to trigger that mess. And those guys, sometimes if they've had it since childhood and they have not grown out of it, because most kids do grow out of it, um, if they have not grown out of it, that's when you get into the status asthmaticus, and that's when people die really quick if you don't do something about it. So we need to get that proper health history. We need to know if they got the COPD. They'll say, I, I think I got the COPD. All right, cool. You got the COPD. So when I go and listen to his lung expansion and it's shallow and it sounds like just a whole bunch of nothingness and, and sludge all mixed together, I'm not going to be surprised by that. But if I have absolutely no health history whatsoever and I don't have any lung issues and I haven't smoked and then all of a sudden I can't hear a right middle lobe, what does that tell you? That tells you I have a collapse, buddy, and we got a problem. <laughs> we need to do something about it. So make sure you're getting an appropriate history. I tell you this because if you are on a unit, you more than likely have gotten a patient that has come through ER because there are very few direct admits. And in the ER, these guys blow through in five minutes or less these health histories, which look pretty pitiful. And then we find out they've got all kinds of problems when they get up to me. Um, and they want to go ahead and give me a graphic novel about it. And that's cool because we need it. Believe it or not, we do need these things. Um, make sure that you understand the prescriptions, right? We don't want them to miss a Spiriva if they're used to a daily Spiriva because what happens to the body when it doesn't get its Spiriva and it expects it because it's a corticosteroid? What happens when you don't get your steroids, friends? Your body gets pissed. How about that? Your body gets really, really angry and it starts to react. If it's used to getting things at clockwork, your body knows when it's coming. Your body knows if you have perforated intestines and they are out on the ground because you got stabbed. All I do is I shove them back in. I close the wound after I've cleaned it. I give you your staples and stitches and your steri strips. And then I let them go back to their home. The intestines know how to go back to their home because the body system is that perfect. Believe it or not, it's that fragile, but it's also that perfect because it has a network that talks to each other. Because, again, we work off of what? Energy, frequency, and vibrational pattern, which is absolutely in our body and absolutely a thing. And I'm going to prove it to you this entire semester. So listen up. you got to make sure you got a good health history. got to make sure you know what meds. you got to make sure that they're on oxygen. If somebody says, I only wear oxygen at night, buddy, you better put that oxygen right there right then because what they're probably not used to is having a bathroom that is on the other side of their room they're probably used to having an adjacent bedroom and bathroom set up or they're right next to a bathroom if they're a copd or that's just something that they do they know to stay close to those guys and needing oxygen at night only tells me that you're going to need it during the daytime in a hospital setting because everything is different the environment's different the length of walk you need to do is different. The amount of talking you do is different. When you're at home as a single individual and you got COPD, you can take those good breaths. When you're talking, trying to give me a detailed health history, you're already gassed out. Get that oxygen at the gate right then. Make sure that you understand surgeries or treatments. If they've had um, a, a neck injury and they had titanium screws back in the 90s, those can get into those nerves that we talked about earlier, and that can shut off the signal to the diaphragm if it gets deep enough. I've actually had a patient that's had that happen before. It migrated out, and it, it didn't quite sever that nerve, but it severed a nerve close to it, and that person magically had dysfunction. So I know it sounds really scary and daunting. There's a lot of pieces and parts. I tell you all the pieces and parts because after 10 years of doing this, I've seen a lot of these pieces and parts. And if you grab one of these things that I tell you off and you use it later in life, then I've, I've helped you along the way. So I don't care if I throw 5,000 nuggets at you and your mouth only catches four. That's four more than you had. I am down with that. I am so down. So let's just keep moving on because I think I've already figured out what I need to say for this slide. Yep, I'm done. 
And again, here's the easy stuff. We need to know if they got COPD, cystic fibrosis, asthma. If they have cystic fibrosis, we need what's called a jiggle jacket or um, uh, like a, a timpani um, chest vest or whatever they call it nowadays. We, we call them jiggle jackets. It's a, it's a, it's a vibratory um, machine that shakes the chest cavity and in shaking the chest cavity, AKA a vibrational pattern. Oh my God, she just did it again. Oops, I did it again, like Brenda Spears. Whenever we do that, what we do is we kick off all of that excess um, sputum that's thick and, and frothy and chokes them to death from the inside out. So you absolutely need to make sure that if they, if they have cystic fibrosis, um, that you know that you need to go ahead and get that order immediately because it's going to be a thing. 100% of the time, if you get cystic fibrosis, you're going to need a jiggle jacket, period, point, paragraph. Same with COPD and asthma, same with smoking history, yada, yada, yada. So make sure you get your good subjective data as well. Oh, by the way, if someone says that they smoke a pack a day for the last 40 years, they probably smoke a pack and a half. If someone says that they've had two beers and they're in there for alcohol withdrawal, they've not had two beers, you usually go ahead and multiply it by three. Just assume that that's the number in your head because that's generally what happens because people get embarrassed. So just keep those things in mind as well. You want to make sure these guys have good nutrition. You want to make sure that you know if they have any fluctuations in weight. Um, this picture of this guy is pretty interesting to the left. This was him when he was doing a 5K. To the right was him, only it was a couple of weeks later. So that's how much fluid overload will do a person. This guy was on this weird kick where they uh, drink like a gallon and a half of water a day, and they have very little caloric intake, and they basically put themselves in a state of overload so that when they do these 5Ks, these 10Ks, these half marathons, these marathons, they burn off this water, but they don't have to stop to go drink more water. So they get a better run time. It's crazy nutty cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs, but it's a thing and it absolutely happens. This is also a thing that we do in boxing when we're trying to, what we call skipping our weight. So we will throw our weight off on purpose in the preliminaries so that when we go to actually weigh in, we're significantly lower and we can bump to a different weight class. We do these little jazzy things all the time. If you ever wanna know how to lose 10 pounds in a terrible way overnight, I got you. Come see me. It will literally drip off of your jacket when you rip it off of you. But it's a ghastly thing to do to your system. And after a billion years of doing it to my body, it's so, it's so wackadoo. It doesn't even know what it needs anymore. So I would never encourage you to do that. But again, this is what we're talking about. This is why we need to check for these weight fluctuations because this causes cardiomegaly on the heart over time, right? Something's got to get ticked off. And if the body is expanding and contracting to um, accommodate for this fluid overload you throw yourself into purposefully, then it's it's going to affect your heart because your heart's going to be like, wait, am I working hard? Am I not working hard? What am I doing? What am I doing? I'm going to stop. No, I'm going to go. It does that. And after a while, it just becomes this beast uh, that is cardiomegaly and it turns into CAD and CHF. So watch yourself. So we need to get a good subjective data with these people as well. Um, sleep rest patterns. We need to know those because if they're waking up in the middle of the night, is it because they're going to the bathroom or is it because they got to put another extra pillow up under them? You know what I mean? Like, it's that kind of a deal. Um, are you getting night sweats? Do you wake up gasping for air? Because if you do, you have apnea and that's a big deal. Let me go ahead and give you my apnea speech that I want you to really understand. And when we get into cardiology, I'm absolutely going to make sure that this is, this is a test question if I have anything to do with it. So what happens is people don't like to wear their apnea machines because it, it, it feels very funny. I used to talk so much trash about people who wore CPAP machines. And I'm like, why can't y'all be compliant? Da, 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 da. You know, like a person who complains about smokers when they've never smoked a cigarette and don't understand the addiction behind it. I do. I get it. Been there, done that. Got the t-shirt. It's large. So here's how apnea works. So apnea isn't necessarily a lung problem. A lot of times it's a your tongue is too big and then you swallow it problem. A lot of times it's you can be 135 pounds, but if your neck circumference is so large because you're a football player and you burst out your sternocleidomastoid muscles so that you could, you know, kick someone in the teeth a little bit better when you're knocking them down, 
then that's going to be a problem. So I don't want you to think this as an overweight person problem. That's a stigma that we have. It's a stigma that sucks and it needs to go away immediately. That's not necessarily the issue. Matter of fact, um, obesity, I think it's a 50-50. I'm going to look back at the statistics, but I think it's surprising because most people think it's 90% of the population is morbidly obese and apneic. Dude, that's not the deal at all. A lot of times this is a my pieces and parts that were given to me by genetics was too big to the ratio of me laying down flat. So they got to lay on their belly. These are kids that traditionally lay on their belly on purpose. And even when they're 10 and 12 and 15 years old, they you won't catch them laying on their back. Um, and again, it's because sometimes um, their their tongue is too large and they swallow it in the night. So Make sure that you're not um, stigmatizing these people and make sure that you're not bullying them with information that you have half-heartedly. Make sure you do your research before you, you talk to them about these things because it's embarrassing because of the stigma that goes along with it, right? No one wants to hear, you know, hey, you're morbidly obese, you probably have apnea. Now, here's a tall tale sign of a person who is apneic if you are curious. If you have a lab and you got a platelet count, you will know if a person is apneic because that platelet count will kick on up into the air. It'll be higher than it's supposed to be. And you're going to be like, what the heck is this about? And it's because that's the body's response. It will call out more oxygenated blood cells to come. And that comes along with it is what? Your pa -pa -pa platelets. So they will have a higher platelet count by nature. Um, so, and it'll be significantly higher. So there will be no mistake about it whatsoever if these guys have that issue or not. So I would encourage you before you give them the apnea talk, before you give them the, you're too heavy, you need to lose weight and that's going to fix all the problems talk. You, you educate yourself with this and you double check to make sure that that's more than likely the issue and that you tell them that they might need a sleep study because sometimes, and I put it like this, sometimes your body mechanics and your body genetics, they work together to produce a, a perfect specimen, which is you, just in the way you are right now. And unfortunately, sometimes they get into an argument and never really resolve it. So this is where we come into problems with swallowing our tongue sometimes. Or sometimes our circumference of our neck is too big because the muscles around it are also too big. So by default, you lose. When you throw it like that, all of a sudden, it's not a fat people problem, which is not cool. Um, I, I never thought that that was a good thing to ever do to anybody, and I don't know why we still do it. Um, I just, I hate that. So cognitive perceptual pattern, again, pain with breathing, neurologic changes. I'm going to get sleepier. So if I'm sleeping all freaking day long, and then I wake up in the middle of the night, or if I'm talking to you and I'm like kind of dozing off as I'm talking to you, guess what? It might be apnea. It probably is apnea or a super boring teacher that goes on for four minutes and 30 seconds about the body process and what she thinks about it. So remember those things. It's super important. It's going to come back on you again. So when we're giving people this operating instruction and we're expressing education to them, we need to make sure that we're not being ridiculous to them, okay? I don't want you wagging your finger at anybody and telling them to stop smoking because they have COPD and you know they're smoking. Oh, man, that's revolutionary. That person's never heard that a day in their life, right? So don't be that guy. What you can do is what they call constraint exploration, and that is talking about what is causing you to continue this. Is it anxiety? Is it just the need to have something in your hand? Um, what alternatives can we have that will help out your process and always bring it back to their ability to breathe. Always make them understand how they feel. Sometimes we don't understand how we feel until we express it and project it to somebody else. So sometimes I have to look at a patient and I go, look, here's what I see. I see you struggling to breathe and all you can think about is having a cigarette. And it's probably because you're incredibly stressed out because you know your time is limited because you have the COPD process and you feel like you have no control over anything in the world because you're stuck to 10 feet of tubing. And I understand that. And all you want to do is just smoke because it makes you nervous. And all you want to do is not be able to breathe because you're smoking. So what can we do? What's the alternative? What can we get our what can we get our hands doing and our body doing? to make you feel like you have more control in this world so that you can feel more independent. We have to consider independence as a factor every time we deal with these patients that have respiratory issues. 
they are going to have a hard time coming off of things because they have to be addicted to something, not because of the addiction, not because they really want to smoke, because honestly, these guys with COPD don't want to smoke. The problem is they have a need to be autonomous and they don't have the autonomy. I was sitting here having the spiel with my Monday class and I sounded a little cynical. I was like, guys, I just don't get it. I was a smoker myself and I don't understand how the first thing you want to do is smoke while you've got COPD and you're choking to death. And then I drove home later on that evening and I thought, oh, well, that totally makes sense why that would be a thing. Because I, I think about everything you guys say and all the questions you ask in the day. I, I think a lot about you. I spend most of my day thinking about all of you. So when you tell me these things, I reflect on myself and I go, wait, am I just projecting the fact that I'm angry because I truly don't have any control over what's going to happen to my lungs? So by yelling at the fact that no one should understand that process is somehow going to make me not get COPD because I smoked for 15 years, right? And then it dawned on me, oh, man, I'm trying to have control over the situation, which is what these people are trying to do as well. That was the three-minute tangent on how things work from a psychosomatic perspective because, again, I don't care how great your body is. If your brain ain't right, your body's going to go with it. So you got to keep that in mind. Brain number one. Brain number one. Cardiac number two. Just saying, keep that in mind because I know cardiologists and they are the football players of the cafeteria and they're sitting at the cool table and I'm not. I'm over there playing D&D. So rolling back to what we're saying, make sure that you understand these people. Try not to be hypocritical. And, you know, I'm the one that just got hypocritical on Monday and my students looked at me like, come on, Molly, you know why this is going on. And, you know, you don't think about it until somebody calls you out on it. So make sure that we're appropriately having a conversation with these people. Sometimes we say things and we don't think about what we say. If you're like me and you have autistic spectrum disorder, you never think about what you say until your student looks at you like they've just been harmed. And then you go, oh, boy, I probably laid it on too much and I probably need to explain myself. By the way, if I ever do that to you, you have to let me know immediately because I honestly, that trigger is not in my brain. I cannot stress that enough. If I say something to offend you, you have to let me know. I will immediately apologize. I know I've said this in slides before. I will immediately apologize to you because I do not know that what I'm saying or how I'm saying it or how I'm expressing it, even through, you know, 20 years of cognitive behavioral therapy like I don't know at all like I, it's a it's a weird brain body experience it just doesn't exist I, I have a very flat effect I have a very flat voice I'm aware of all these things which is why when we're doing these warm-ups together and we're doing these um, you know these sessions of lecture and class I'm completely over the top ridiculous right which completely depletes my energy for the day but I do it so that you guys understand how proud of you I am because I know if I say, hey, I'm proud of you, I know what that sounds like to you. It sounds like it's just an overpass statement that doesn't mean anything in the world. And I want to embellish it by being completely ridiculous because, A, it's funny, right? You got a teacher that's kind of outside of the box and outside of the green, and it's nice and it's new and it's different. And because I genuinely want you to know how much I am appreciative of you and how proud I am of everything that you guys have accomplished and everything you're going to accomplish because you're going to get through this. Okay, I'm done with my five-minute tangent. Take care of your subjective data. You know what you're doing. All right, make sure you're not mixing up your subjective data with your objective data. I'm telling you this out of kindness because doctors really don't like it when you give them subjective data and not objective data because the way that they think is technical data. So they, got, they, they don't touch a patient for five years. I don't know if you know that. So what they do is they'll go through their bachelor's program. They'll get it in chemistry. They'll get it in a microbio. And then they'll do another four years um, to get to the level of doctor. That doesn't mean anything because once you're a doctor, then you finally get to talk about patients. And then you have to go with, through a residency program, and it's anywhere from three to five years. And then you have a fellowship, and your fellowship is, hey, I might get hired over here. And then finally you're a doctor, and by that time we're 10, 12, sometimes 15 to 17 years in, depending if you are a neurosurgeon or not. We always laugh and say neurosurgeons are the smartest people in the world because they have uh, been into school from the time they wake up and are born to the time they retire. And by the time they are neurosurgeons, they're about two years from retirement, which is a good thing that they get paid uh, the upwards of $2 million a year because they need it. 
digressing. Make sure that you don't mix objective and subjective data. They want to know the bits and bones that matter. Hi, my name is Sally, and I'm over here trying to figure out this new patient in 207 that got here because they had an injury and then they came up, but they have some family here as well. I don't care about all those things. I'm so sorry. I love you. That's so great. Someone might be dying and you haven't even gotten to what's going on. Hey, this is Sally. I've got 207. Last name, Golby. Golby's here. This is the problem we're having. This is what they came in for. Something's wrong. Shush the mouth and wait for the doc to process and think and say something. These guys run off the technical data. You're talking pie charts. You're talking uh, scales galore, right? They're, they're running code in their brain immediately because they got 30 seconds to make a decision. They haven't even laid eyes on this person. So please understand they're not being ugly. They're really rolling their eyes because they're like, can you just get to the part where I have to use my brain because I don't know that I have much brain left in me because it's been a long day for them. They have the upwards of 25 to 30, sometimes 40 patients. Sometimes they're on call, which means they're literally sleeping when you call them. They are laying in a bunk bed that is in the physician's office, and they are passed out because they have worked for 36 hours straight and not been able to sleep. So when they get a little, a little nasty, a little necky, a little nippy with them, throw it right back at them as kindly as you can and go, look, I know you're tired and I know you're probably on call right now, but I need to get this figured out. And they will shape up and they will ship out and give you what you need. Don't be afraid to talk to these people because guess what? They're people just like you and I. I'm no better than you are and you guys are no better than I am. So we need to treat each other as equals. Make sure that you do that and make sure you command respect as well because they will try to steal your thunder and steal your light from you and that is not acceptable. So make sure that you got your objective data in there. There's your list. I'm not going to go over it. You guys can read. That's why y'all so smart. So for the purposes of your NCLEX, I am going to talk on this slide. Objective data, thoracic and lungs, inspect, palpate, percuss, auscultate. Make sure that you've got that in the right order. Okay? Make sure. So we need to make sure that we're doing these things appropriately. If your NCLEX says otherwise, then you need to talk to Elsevier because this is the way Elsevier's got their slides. I would double check your NCLEX uh, RN notebook and make sure that this is the four ways because they will ask you to put this in order. I don't know why. I can't tell you why. I don't know why that matters in the world. I guess I do know why it matters in the world, but it's not enough of a definitive to make an argument for it. So just make sure that you understand the difference between inspection, palpation, percussion, and auscultation and why you do it in that order. Please do that. Um, are you going to need it for this? Are you going to need to memorize it for this? You're going to need to memorize it because you're going to need to know it, period. So just go ahead and get it over with and, and memorize IPA, IPPA. I don't even feel like reading this slide to you. So read it. You know what it says. Um, I think it's pretty self-explanatory. So this is kind of a gnarly test to be able to uh, find out what your tidal volume is or how your chest expansion is. Um, make sure that you're doing your palpation, your tracheal position to make sure everything is aligned appropriately. Uh, your expansion we just talked about. That's when you stick your thumbs at the, usually at the lower thoracic area. Um, you can call it the top of the lumbar if you want to. But that's more lower thoracic, mid thoracic. Eh, lower mid thoracic there we're done and then have them breathe in and as you do you should be able to spread those thumbs apart about an inch that's a good tidal volume um, that's a good way of us doing it without needing an incentive spirometer we don't have to leave the room everything's nice now again we go back to energy frequency and vibration and we got what for 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 amidus. and what is that that is the vibration that is created within your body during chest rise and chest drop it also um, is a resonance uh, that you have that transitions through your, out, throughout your uh, entire body when you are vocalizing something. So when you vocalize something, your body actually feels it all the way to the tips of your toes. That's why when sometimes you hear a dog barking, you will physically get pain from it. I don't know if you guys have ever had that phenomenon. It's a phenomenon called synesthesia. Um, it, it's and a lot of people who have Asperger's, which is why they, they go into sensory overload so often, uh, because they taste shapes and they hear colors and, um, some musicians do the same thing and they find out later that they're on the spectrum. So this is a phenomenon where your entire body 
um, has a vocalization pattern that runs through your entire system. So if you've ever wondered why you get around a person and you're like, I don't know that dude, but I don't like that dude, right? And you just can't figure it out. It's not because they're a bad person. Well, maybe they are. It's because whatever frequency, vibrational pattern, and movement that you have with your electrical conductivity in your body, it is like oil and vinegar. Uh, oil and vinegar works. It's like oil and water. There we go. That, that That's better. It's like the polar opposite of what you are projecting and you physically don't like that person. So it's nothing that you do wrong. It's your genetics telling you that something that they got ain't right. So that is a trigger over um, years and years and years and uh, generations and evolution um, that has taught us to feel our way through existence because believe it or not, our feelers are more important than what we say. There's two types of language, the language we speak audibly and then the language that we feel uh, when we are around somebody and something just ain't right. You know what I mean? That's the stuff that I'm trying to pull out of you guys because that's that intuition uh, that isn't a nurse's intuition. You were born with it. You were meant to use it. You were meant to shine with it. You were meant to raise your vibration and create a better coexistence on this planet with it. You just don't know it quite yet, but we'll get there. So again, going back to the vibration, this is the 99 movement. I have them say 99, move down the trail. If something doesn't feel right, if the timpani isn't right, if the resonance isn't right, all these are words you're like, huh, probably, you'll get there, right? I, I'm not going to test you on 99 and timpani, right? That's silly. Um, I'm, like I said, I'm trying to give you these abstract concepts because you already got what you need. What I'm trying to do is heighten your ability and your awareness to realize how intricate the system of nursing is and how many pieces and parts there really are that goes beyond the level of what our brain is able to comprehend from a normal standpoint unless someone pulls it out of you and tells you what you really are in this world. So one of the things that a lot of people have a problem with is just the standard mode of day to day when it comes to nursing, right? You give your pills, you do your assessments, you look at your technical data. It's very hardwired, but there's so much more. It's like watching the beginning of Wizard of Oz and it's black and white and you're like, hey, this is a cool movie. And then it goes into Technicolor and you're like, whoa, right? This is that other piece of the part that I'm trying to give you that uh, a lot of people don't know quite what it means because they're not nerds like I am. And um, I'm happy to give you that gift if you're willing to take it and let it resonate with you. So this is a good slide on the sequence of your examination. I've never seen this on an NCLEX. I think I remember seeing it on a HESI, but it was more ape to men related than this specifically. So um, make sure that you drag and drop appropriately and listen for things. Uh, make sure that you're checking your jugulars. You know, you're checking to see if there is any brewy in there. Um, you want to check your carotids. Um, you know, look for all the things that you need to look for. Uh, and then move on because this slide really doesn't have a whole lot for us to go over. So percussion is a big deal when you're talking about timpani. Um, when you have someone with a pericardial effusion, that is when the heart is basically being crushed by fluid. Um, you will fill the timpani off of it, and percussion is how you're going to do it. So am I going to teach you how to do percussion on this? No. Are you going to be testing on percussion on this? No. Is it going to come around on the big three? Probably not. Is it something that you absolutely need because someone's going to die if you don't figure it out? Uh-huh, uh-huh, that's going to be a thing. So you need to make sure you're listening out for it. When you do this percussion, it's so bizarre to your patients because they're like, what kind of non-Western, you know, native indigenous medicine are you doing right now? But it is backed by evidence-based practice. We can hear physically when the liver starts and stops. We can hear when we have hypodense tissue by way of an effusion. And that's a big problem because some of these people can die from an effusion, especially if it's a pericardial effusion. If these guys get, you know, the upwards of 500 milliliters, uh, we start going into torsades and then we kick the bucket really, really quick. So you got to be able to know if we need to tap into that heart quick, fast, and in a hurry. And if we need to do it on an emergent and do it at a bedside, I've actually had the experience of doing that one time in my life. And that was the only time I needed to do that ever again in my life because that was super cool after that because it is buh, 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 brutal to watch but also super cool think pulp fiction 
if that's even a movie you guys know because you don't know Back to the Future either. Oh, God, I'm so old. So make sure that you're um, doing it and uh, make sure that you're if you're suspicious and they're having trouble and you can't quite figure out what's going on. Um, it's never a bad idea to kind of walk over or percuss an area just to see if you're not missing anything. And again, it's wackadoo and you feel like you're going nuts and then you're like, wait, this really is a thing. And then you start doing it pretty much on the regular. And again, here's percussion on the back. I'm not going to sit here and talk about it for five minutes. Y'all look at it and uh, yeah, move on. So again, here's more of your assessment of the respiratory system. I'm just going to go ahead and, and kick this slide out right now because you'll need it to look at it. And other than that, uh, there's nothing to add. This slide's important because you need to know all the different sounds. Um, Adventitious sounds are a big deal. Um, crackles, fine versus coarse are going to make a difference. Some might sound like more of an influenza issue, or it could be a pleural effusion because someone's got non-small cell, or it could be traditional CHF. You just really need to be able to hear it. And, and the, the better you get at listening to these sounds, the easier it's going to be for you to differentiate them. And that's all that this says is know what all that sounds like. Know that there are abnormal voice sounds that shouldn't make sense. Um, know that if someone has uh, more of a bronchial talk or more of a whispered talk, um, I don't know if you guys know who Jennifer Tilly is, but she has a very um, bronchophony type of a voice. It's this weird kind of like talking, but weird kind of uh, ejection of oxygenation type of sound. And it's because um, she had a throat injury as a child that nearly killed her. So you, you kind of need to know the difference in these little bad boys because um, it can make a difference in how you're going to approach your patient. This stuff, if you know this stuff, you are a highly, highly specialized nurse, a respiratory nurse, and you probably got three years under your belt at least don't feel like this is going to be a big deal right now. Just know that you need to really practice and understand what these sounds mean, what they're associated with, and more than likely what your treatment option is going to be so that you can go ahead and get the kick off and start working it before you even have to call your doctor. Um, when I hear CHF in a patient that's exacerbative and I know my, my resident because we're cool with each other or because we went to school together, I won't even call them. I shouldn't say this out loud. I won't even call him. Um, as a nurse, I will just go ahead and pull it, um, and I'll be at the bedside, and then I will call him on Vocera and be like, hey, real quick, this guy is uh, in CHF exacerbation. I can't lay him down. His oxygen says 89. His creat is 1.2. He can handle it. His kidneys can handle it. I got 20 Elasics in my hand. Am I pushing or not? And he's like, yeah, buddy. Done. Right. I know that that's not the traditional method. I want you to focus on the traditional method for this for the sake of your textbook and the sake of your exams in the real world. That is not how it goes, because you know what? I don't give up about a textbook. I care about the patient that's in front of me that's got a minute and a half before he starts to tank on me. And I don't need to call a code if I can fix it. And if I already know what I need to fix it with, and I already know my doc's going to approve me for it because we're kicking it and we know each other real well, that's the kind of relationship that is the deep relationship I want you guys to have where there's implicit trust and you feel confident in yourself and you know what you're going to have to do to save that person and you're not afraid to go ahead and make that bold statement of, hey, it's already in my hand. Do you want me to go ahead and push it? Because they will always 100% of the time, if you state your case and the evidence is there, 100% go, oh my God, thank you, every single time. Okay, I'm done with the slide. So this slide's pretty interesting and it's very factual. So this one's, this one's super important. Make sure that you understand the things that affect the accuracy of these uh, mechanisms that check these vital signs. So I can't tell you how many times, and you're never going to believe me when I say this, but a couple of you will because a couple of you I work with. I have actually had a pulse ox completely off of a patient, and it was reading an oxygenation of 76. So someone went running into the room because they – thought that a patient's oxygen was 76 and hey admirable that's amazing only up under the spo2 there is a little thing called waveform and if there's no waveform then that means it's off of your finger right they have what's called a pleth and it literally looks like a wave right like a little ocean wave and it's pretty steady and if that wave is not steady that means it's either off of their finger completely if there's nothing there or um, it is slightly off of their finger or their finger sweaty or it's an old pulse ox. 
So don't go running into any rooms. No nurse should ever run, period. No nurse should ever run, again, unless you want to get yelled at. No nurse, doctor, anybody should ever run down the hallway because you will immediately be screamed at by about 15 people. Don't do it. It's not a thing. Not unless the code blue is on. That's the only time you run. I'm done with my piece on that one. So you need to know that these pieces and parts will malfunction on you. I cannot tell you how many times I told the story of <laughs> one of our smartest nursing students who used to brag, like hard brag, like not humble brag, like hard brag on how smart she was, which was super cool, whatever, <laughs> as far as I'm concerned. So this gal and I just happened to be on the same unit and I was dreading it like the Black Plague. And I was working with a patient. She went running down the hallway. I was like, what's going on? I went after her. She's like, this patient says Sicily. And I was like, you all right, ma'am? And they're like, yeah, why? What's going on? And I'm like, he ain't a Sicily. He just answered my question. <laughs> like, and, and, you know, that's just what you have to do sometimes because you will realize that these GE monitors, I don't care how much money they cost, if that left lead is not on it will show up as asystole so don't go running after your patient because your box is screaming asystole casually walk over make sure that they're responding if they're responding and they're doing it clearly they are not dead so please understand that that's all the slide says okay i'm done so capnography is different than traditional spo2 so what it does is it measures um, the CO2 itself, which is super important because why? Because we don't want to what? We don't want to put them in acidosis because these guys will go in acidosis very easily, specifically COPDers. I say it over and over for a reason, guys. Listen to the words that are coming out of my mouth. So um, make sure that you also have uh, an understanding of venous blood gases, which are a little bit different. They call them VBGs versus ABGs. Um, this is going to be a problem as well because remember, it's going to run through the system in a different type of way. So we need to know what that measurement looks like because long story short, um, one thing might be affected and the other one might be fine. So your PaO2 might be in the 50s, but your uh, regular SpO2 or traditional SpO2 is maybe like 88. So that PaO2 is telling me that you are not getting full circulation of your body, and that's why this is such a big deal. So if there is ever an opportunity for you to understand the difference between these two, you need to know both of them. I don't know why we don't talk about PaO2 enough, um, but you will have patients specifically that have new processes of respiratory distress, so like COVID, influenza, um, and they'll be on a couple of liters in nasal cannula, and you'll be like, cool, their SpO2 is 88. Um, that's really good for someone who's got influenza. I can live with that, even if they are not traditionally doing as well as they're supposed to. Um, the problem is, the bigger deal is oxygenation is not going to be effective, and the treatment is not going to be effective of that oxygen if your PaO2 level is only 55% or 65% or 52% or 78% for that matter, because we know those ranges are 80 to 100. So that's the bigger deal in the long run versus the SpO2 of 88, because that would be a normal finding for someone who has an infectious viral process um, like, uh, you know, a pneumonia that's new for them or um, a viral process like influenza. So you need to know that. You need to write that down. You need to commit that to memory because those things are going to happen. All right, so different sputum studies. We've got traditional spit-in-the-cup method or expectoration. We've got suctioning. we got bronchoscopy. Self-induced is going to be, hey, cough and deep breathe or use an incentive spirometer. Teach them effective specimen production. This is important, especially when we're dealing with things like, oh, I don't know, tuberculosis. That's a big deal. Um, so we usually do this through tuberculin skin tests. Sure, we do induration checks. If it's five millimeters, we're going to assume that they're cool unless they're immunocompromised. They have AIDS, they have HIV, they've on chemotherapy, they're, you know, non-small cell lung cancer, they have sickle cell, et cetera, et cetera. Um, otherwise, the, the benchmark is going to be 10 um, anything above 10 is going to show the active or quote-unquote normal person um, is not going to have that infectious process. It might just be because they're a nurse and have had 
58 skin tuberculin tests because that's what's required of them for that facility. Just keep that in mind. Um, we need to let them know that if they are doing a sputum sample and we're checking for something like, oh, I don't know, TB, we need to make sure that they understand that this is a bacteriologic test, which is completely different. So they need to provide sputum specimens for three consecutive days. One more time, three consecutive days, three consecutive days. So make sure that they're getting those things like they're supposed to and make sure that you are writing down this education. No, really, I'll, I'll give you a second. This one needs written down because you need to understand the sputum test that we do for TB is a three day deal. And I cannot tell you how many times I have to fuss with these guys about it because they're like, where there's my sputum cup right there. And I'm like, no, 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 brother. That is not my, that's not it right there. That's not what I need. I need a sputum culture for acid fast bacillus. And I need for it to be a consecutive three day specimen sputum culture, acid fast bacillus. That's the only TB test that we do the sputum. And it's gotta be three consecutive days. Okay. I'm done. That's it. Now, when we're dealing with diagnostic studies like a bronchoscopy, and this is a really great picture of how that looks, um, we are sometimes shaving off pieces of tissue. We need to watch out for this because what are we going to be at risk for? Bleeding. Where are we going to be at risk for bleeding in? Your lung. Is that a bad day? Yup, that's a bad day. And these guys will start coughing, and it really scares you the first time that you have a post-bronch who starts coughing on you because you're like, please don't have chunks of blood coming out. Please don't have chunks of blood coming out. And guess what? Sometimes they have chunks of blood coming out, so get ready for it. Um, make sure that when these guys are post-bronchoscopy, you have to assess them with what they call an ice test. So give them a couple of pieces of ice, and if for whatever reason they cough when you give them that ice, put them in P-O-E immediately. Do not pass go. Do not collect $200. Do not say, oh, you were clearing your throat. Don't do any of those things. Those things are really dumb. You are going to hurt your patient and potentially even worse. They have to be NPO. It is a medical emergency if these guys start choking post bronc and they start coughing up so much from choking that they start coughing up blood because that will mean that you have busted an area internally a couple of hours post-op, your doc is not going to be happy with you. That patient is not going to be happy with you. So, again, when you're talking about someone who's giving basic ice, I don't care what the situation is. It could be post-bronc. It could be, you know, post-stroke. Whatever you want to do, you have got to stop them immediately. Make them MPO. Get speech pathology. And you know what? Deal with the fact that they're going to be super ticked off. And you know what? Cool. At least you're not dead. I'm cool with that. No big deal. So, again, make sure we verify your consent. Make sure they're MPO. Make sure they understand they're going to be sedated. Afterwards, until that gag reflex returns, give them a nice study. Usually it's two hours after. Give them a nice study. If they choke or if they cough, they're done. And they're done until speech sees them and clears them. And that's that. Don't put that on you. Okay. All right. I'm done with the slide. All right. And then when we're talking about bronchlavage, this is where we put sterile saline um, through the scope. And we uh, basically push it in. A lavage means a wash. So usually we do bronchlavages uh, when we have what we call mucus plugs. We have this in patients with cystic fibrosis. Uh, we have this in patients who are ridiculously heavy smokers, who have trachs. That's a huge one. And a bronchlavage basically uh, breaks apart that mucus plug. Sometimes these mucus plugs are as big as a golf ball. I'm not even playing with you right now. And you'll know if this is a mucus plug. And I know not to get into, like, I know this is getting super weird and, like, gross. But when you give oxygen to somebody and you crank it up to, like, five, and that oxygen set is not changing, the next thing you need to do as a nurse is get your pretty little hand that you have, put a little piece of water over top of it, right? So like throw your hand up under the sink real quick, put your hand, clap it in your hand, and then put it over that patient's mouth. And what you will feel is that five liters coming out of their mouth because it's got nowhere else to go. When that happens, you better get to walking really, really fast. You better be calling a rapid because that needs an immediate lavage. 
you will not forget when that happens because you will be so stumped going, wait, I just cranked that up to five. Hey, real quick, give me a non-rebreather. Wait, that's not changing either. Well, I, but I, uh, uh, if that ever happens, just go ahead and feel for that. Like if you have like super like gnarly mechanic hands, like I said, throw some water over top of it because I got super gnarly mechanic hands. I can't feel very much on them. Not because of neuropathy because I'm old guys, but because I got rough, tough hands there. Tough. So you'll need that extra buffer and you'll feel that wind and you'll be like, ah, crap, here we go. This is going to be bad. So what I usually do is to break that, just so you know for right now, is I will turn them to the left, turn them to the right, turn them to the left, turn them to the right, and then do what I do is uh, like a back blow. Not like a back blow like you're doing CPR. It's not the same. I'll do a firm, um, I'm making this sound right now, I'll do a firm pat using the heel of my hand um, to kind of break it up because that is the same type of complex that we would use if we were using a jiggle jacket and that'll be just enough to get it out of the way so you can at least get some oxygenation while you're trying to call respiratory and call a rapid for them. So keep that in mind. That's your life hack for uh, uh, bronchlavages and uh, people who have mucus plugs. There you go. A little nugget of information. So here's the other associated surgeries that go along with biopsies. Am I going to test you on this? Absolutely not. Are you going to see it on the big three? Nah, it ain't going to be a thing. I've never seen these in my entire life other than working respiratory um, and knowing what they were. But other than the ones at the bottom, um, it's it's not going to be something that you do quite often. You do need to watch out for things. Pneumothorax is a big deal. Uh, tension pneumothorax, you got minutes. Um, it's such a bad scene. Uh, you'll have tracheal deviation. You don't mistake that at all. Um, I've had a couple of those. It's awful. It's just awful. Just awful. Um, uh, chest tubes, we'll get into that in a little bit, but just here's your various little things. So don't worry too much about it. Just give it a go, walk over it and be done. So everyone freaks out about a thoracentesis, but a thoracentesis is not a big deal. It sounds like a huge deal. And by the way, there is never a syringe at the end of a thoracentesis. That is the dumbest thing I've ever seen in my entire life. These people have glass jars because when you do a thoracentesis, it is so bad that you are willing to risk perforating a lung, which is what you are doing in order to get this fluid out, basically. So they are very, very serious about doing them. They're not going to be like, Bink, okay, I got five milliliters. We're good. That's not even a thing. I don't even know why they did this diagram. Whoever did that diagram is an artist and not in the medical field whatsoever because you would know better than that immediately. So these guys who need thoracentesis uh, thoris have pleural effusions that have a liter in there, a half a liter, two liters. Some of these guys who have non-small cell cancer like my dad had before he passed to COVID, he um, would have a thoracentesis every couple of days, every couple of days. And they have these huge glass liter jars, and you will never forget the thoracentesis the first time you see it because it looks like straight Milwaukee light beer going into these glass jars. And you're like, I don't know whether to be sick to my stomach or whether I want to go to have a adult beverage after work because it really looks synonymous with one another. So I want you to understand that this is a big procedure. It's it's not a big deal in the long run because as far as procedures that we see as nurses, this is meh, probably a five out of ten. Um, and it, it makes them feel so much better almost instantly. So I like going there and watching them because I see how hard they struggle and how difficult it is for them to take a breath. And then when we start to drain half a liter out, a liter out, and then they start to do that cough and they start to freak out, you realize, okay, we got it all out. Cause that's the, remember that's the reflex we talked about earlier, where, um, if you expand too much or you contract too much, it's the reflex that increases your ability to cough or increases your ability to deflate that lung so that it does not uh, blow a gasket basically. Um, so yeah, make sure that you verify consent first, make sure that you got them in the tripod position when we're doing it, cause you're going to be at bedside when this is happening. Make sure you watch them and make sure you're watching for hypoxia. Anytime you have someone, um, with this procedure, it's, it's going to scare you the first time. I've never had any trouble with it. I'm, I'm going to be fair. I've, I've had many a thoracentesis. 
Um, I feel like they're my homeboy. I've done them so often, and I don't think I've ever had any serious complication from it. It's only made things better. But you do need to watch out for hypoxia and pneumo. Obviously, you always have to watch out for pneumo. So PFTs are really important. Uh, your respiratory therapist will do PFTs. So you use a peak flow meter at home. Um, that will help you increase your PFTs. Of course, you've got uh, spirometers. You've got uh, coaching from respiratory therapy. All this is going to be done if you're in an in-house position. You do acute care. Sorry, I got to go on. <sighs> oh, God, it's midnight. I didn't realize it's midnight. Hey, it's midnight. There we go. So. That's why I'm yawning. So make sure that you're watching these things because your respiratory therapist is going to predominantly take care of this. I haven't seen anything on the on the big three on this other than um, checking PFTs to monitor the lung volume function and the airflow. But other than knowing what a PFT is, you don't need to know all the things on the table and the textbook. Don't even stress yourself over it. It's not worth it. Okay, so whenever you have a patient who has shortness of breath and a productive cough. I want you to know in your brain automatically, and you might want to write this down for you know your records. I want you to know if you have a productive cough and you are short of breath, you need to go ahead and, and fight for a chest x-ray right then and there. Bottom line, do not, do not pass go. Do not collect $200. Shortness of breath, productive cough, you better expect a chest x-ray you better anticipate it it's happening this could be a innumerable amount of things however it's more than likely pneumonia or it's covid oh boy or you're exhausted no or um this could be uh, certain types of cancer which is more than likely not an issue but anytime you're short of breath and you get a chest x-ray it could be a pneumo you could have atelectasis in 75% of your lung. You can, God, you can have so many things. Um, I've seen a hyperinflated lung do the same thing. Either way, you need to figure out what's going on, on the inside. So productive cough, shortness of breath, probably pneumonia, might be worse. Get a chest x-ray. Okay, I'm hoping that you've written it down and we're done. And the other things, we do MRIs if we have to later on in life. Sometimes we do PET scans. Um, that's a different type of scan. That'll be the next slide. And I'm moving on. We're done. This is your PET scan. This is a gnarly scan. I've had these before. Long story. Anyways, I've had these before. These are kind of cool. Um, they are like a CT scan and a cancer screen all at the same time. So what happens is, is you sit in a very, very dark room and they bring in this huge container that's cylindrical and is full of titanium alloy. And you're like, what is going on? And they're like, this is titanium and tungsten. It prevents me from being irradiated. I'm about to give it to you. And you go, what? And then when you're done, you have to sit in the dark because it is a metabolite. It is a sugar tracer metabolite. It is wicked wild. And it is supposed to glow on the inside of your body. I kid you not. Hence the glowing over here. We'll get into that in a second. So what its purpose is, is it literally, ah, oh, I said the L word again. I'm going to give it to you. I literally, there you go, literally. I literally um, will see it run to the area of cancer, grab onto it, and get what we call hot spots. So what's really wicked about this is after you've done your PET scan, because God, I've done a million of these by now, you will go past a radioactive activator and you will find out that you were physically nuclear. And what that means is you have to carry a card around you for 24 hours that says, I'm not a terrorist. <laughs> when you go through TSA, as you go through those modules, that little donut that circles around and then you get the little weird body that used to be our actual bodies. And then we finally went crazy on them. So they did the cookie cutter body because at one point, I don't know if you guys knew this because you're pretty young. When we first did the TSA post 9-11, um, it would show our actual bits and bobs. And TSA got in trouble for making fun of people for doing that. And that's why we had the cookie cutter model that we have today. So digressing. When you go through that bad boy, it will send off an entire alert that gets the feds involved. Like those guys come running in. Like SWAT comes running in because it looks like you have a nuclear deterrent attached to you. <laughs> so... 
PET scans are super cool. They are a very good diagnostic for um, cancer and the experience of knowing that you're going to be radioactive for the next 24 hours kind of makes you feel like a superhero and super freaks you out at the same time. And that's all I got for this slide. All right, so let's do this one together. A patient's arterial blood gas or ABG results include the following. pH is 7.32. That is low. PaO2 is 84. That is not ideal. I already know where this is going right now. I don't even need to look at anything else because I've seen the PaO2 is low and I have seen that our pH is low. So we are probably going to be in a respiratory acidosis process, which means this person is going to be tachypnic. I can tell you right now, don't even need to look at the rest of it. And now I am going to look at the rest of it. Look at that. PaCO2, high or low. Which one is it? Which one is it? Three, five to four, five. So CO2 is high, which means what? We got extra positive charges in our in our system, right? SAO2, it is 84, which means our oxygenation is low. This person is respiratory acidotic, and we are tachypnic. And that is my final answer, and I'm sure I'm right, and I have not even looked at the next slide. And see how we hack through that? We've got two values and already knew where we were going just because we understand the net charge. This is why I did the nerd stuff up at the very top of this and I try to explain what the net charge means. If it's a negative charge, it's going to be alkalotic. If it's a positive charge and we got too many positives hanging out in our chest, it's absolutely going to be respiratory acidosis. We are absolutely going to be tachypnic. Make sense? I know it sounds super stupid, but when you break it down in the cartoon in your head, God, I wish you guys had the cartoon in my head because the cartoon in my head is so incredibly vivid. It's like fifth dimensional. It's phenomenal. So I want you to have these cartoons in your head because when you get them, you're going to feel like you have never felt so alive in your entire life. And it's just the wherewithal of having additional knowledge that kind of puts all the pieces together. So this is one of the hacks I always talk about when I'm talking about test taking. I didn't even need to read the question. I knew the answer because I knew what they were going for based off of the first two things that they gave me. And I will teach you guys how to do this. Let's just get through the second exam because I have a lot of people afraid of this exam. And as much as I'd love to start doing that right now, I only need to spend a couple of days teaching teaching you how to hack through a test um, to do a great job and to be successful in that testing. And I don't feel like now is the time to do that. I feel like right now would be a really terrible time considering everything that's going on. Hey guys, this is a great question. This is a phenomenal question. This is one of my favorite questions. So I hope you're listening to me say how much I love this question. So the nurse would interpret an induration of five millimeters resulting from tuberculin skin tests as a positive finding in which patient. So what is it saying? In five millimeter induration, is this going to be a normal patient? No, 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 nope, it's not. So let's see what we got. A patient with a history of IV drug use. I don't care. Like he's an IV drug user. That's terrible. He probably has, I don't know, some cardiac process, right? Does that have anything to do with the fact that they're immunocompromised? Nope, not at all. A patient who has immigrated from India three months ago, ha ha, ha ha, that might be an indicator for giving him the test, but that ain't got nothing to do with me saying that's a positive test. They might just have a reaction from the, the Mantu um, serum. That, that might be all that that is. Uh, a patient with diabetes and end-stage kidney disease, hmm, that's pretty okay, but are they truly immunocompromised? I mean, do they have normal platelet levels? Yep. Okay, how about this one? A patient with human immunodeficiency virus and infected. Ding, ding, ding. Hadn't even looked at it. No, that's the answer. Remember, guys. Remember, you might want to write this one down. It's super important, especially when we're talking about tuberculosis in life. And you will see this on the big three. Oh, buddy, will you see tuberculosis on the big three? Because tuberculosis is always a hot spot because... The virulence level or the level with which you will catch this bug is so incredibly sticky and icky and bad um, that it has the potential to wipe out and eradicate an entire species if done properly. So they are serious about these TB things. Are you ever going to see a lot of TBs? No, you're not. That's the weird thing. I probably have ran into, hmm, Five confirmed TBs, and I worked in a respiratory ICU uh, for, I don't know, seven years maybe. Yeah, that sounds about right. And I continue to work on respiratory units, and I've worked COVID units, and yada, yada, yada. So 
we do these tests pretty often. Um, we, we usually do a chest X-ray in the acute care system if I'm fair. Um, but when we do these, uh, we have to keep these things into consideration. Just because you come from a country that has high tuberculosis levels does not mean you have tuberculosis. Do not give these guys a stigma. It is not cool. It is never cool. Put them in the precaution. Do their test. Get them out of there as soon as possible when you have it confirmed that they're fine. But in the case of 5 millimeter induration, you are absolutely going to see this question on the big three. And it's going to say something along the lines of what type of patient is going to be appropriate to interpret a five millimeter test as a positive and you're going to find anything that says immunocompromised so hiv organ transplants that are recent immunocompromised clients in general cancers all the things this is absolutely going to be a thing you will absolutely see it somewhere along the line if not sooner so make sure that you commit this to memory and know that 10 millimeters on a normal person is the threshold and five is the threshold for someone immunocompromised. You need to know what immunocompromised actually looks like in terms of, you know, they're not, uh, they're not uh, someone who just works in a nursing home and has exposure or someone, you know, that works construction and might have more exposure because, you know, of the socioeconomic factor behind it. So just know that. And I think that's the last slide. Yep. All right, cool. So let's see if I got it right and then we'll be done and then I'll move on to another one. I am right and I'm right because this is an easy question so make sure that you know it because it will come back and I will see you at the next lecture